Yeah, I saw you in uh, Vienna with Mark in, when, when was that, November? Oh, Mark, yeah. Yeah. Airport uh, MS, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, in November, yeah, that was a fun show. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, you know. Yeah, he's I, wonderful, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Man, uh, I mean, I'll ask you about Mark and you You guys had a, have a long musical relationship and you know when i listen to you it's, it sounds like modern ornette and don cherry or something like that it's like really tight you what you guys play really beautiful but uh you know i wanted to ask you about uh, the new one uh live from the summit rock uh, which i saw you have out on your mm -hmm. band camp and uh you know i really love it because you really stretch out the music and you many times you start solo trumpet which i you know it, it's beautiful and uh but i wanted to ask you you wrote really beautiful music and ever since songbook you know i've been following you and uh you've been a prolific writer what's your process usually when writing music or let's say for this one for this life one how do you compose a tune and especially like long compositions i mean i know you guys stretch it out actually but yeah, the, the last one I did, that's probably, I think that's the first record I've done where I've recorded songs that I've previously re recorded. Um, that was a live gig that I did back in 2021 in New York. And I, I don't think I did one gig in a whole year, year before that gig. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Of course. So, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, and I was living out in, in on the West Coast, out in uh, Spokane, Washington, and Jimmy Katz, the uh, Jimmy and Dina Katz, they they started uh, Giants Cap Arts, the um, nonprofit that I've been working with for the past three records that I've done. They um, started putting on concerts out in New York uh, during that time in 2021, and they just wanted to bring music to people in a way, and so they they set up mics and 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 brought in a bunch of great bands and they put on a concert series and for a few of them they for most of them I think they recorded them and and then at, towards the end of uh the year like the middle of 2021 he contacted me and said you know I want to release uh three records from all the concerts that I did would you want to um release that one I was like sure so when I when I did the um gig I didn't know it was going to come out as a record oh and, okay um, but lead, leading up to that recording um I wanted to bring in tunes to the band that we didn't really have to rehearse because market played the music and stuff. So, um, because I, I flew to the East coast and I had a recording and some other stuff, but I knew we wouldn't have time to rehearse and stuff. So I just wanted to put something together that would sound like a band and, and we could really stretch out and play together. Cause I hadn't seen them in like over oh, sure. a year at yeah. that point. And so, so yeah, uh, the tunes on that, on that recording, there's a couple from uh, the record that I put out before that one. Um, I did a, uh, a series of, uh, a set of songs that are based on artwork that was stolen in Boston back about yeah, I saw those. Yeah, yeah. in 1990. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are two recordings from, from that. And then, um, then there's one from a, a record that I did called Places that Mark played on uh, called Falling In. And I think that I think I put a bonus track on my band camp of a tune on my very first record called Laid Up, which Mark hadn't played, but he sounded great yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah. So we just didn't have enough room on the record to fit that tune on it. So I had to uh, put that one as a bonus. So, yeah. Uh, the, the, w w w when you write music, how, how do you approach it? I mean, where do you start usually? Um, you know, I, I usually write from from my head. I, mm. I typically don't use an instrument, although I've been playing guitar um, over the I past. Um, I've been playing guitar over the past two years, almost two years. So I've been trying to write from from that standpoint and stuff. So um, yeah, I usually write from 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 my head to the horn. Or uh, there are very few tunes that come from from the horn itself. Um, 
But, you know, I, I started writing uh, back in the late 90s. I think I first wrote my first tune in 97 well, or something. Already. Well, and I started okay. getting into the habit of, of writing contrafacts. Because at, at, at the time, you know, I was still learning tunes and everything. And so um, I just wanted to learn how to write a melody. And, you know, I didn't want really want to have the burden of saying, okay, what chords can I put with this melody? So what I used to do is I would put on headphones, play along with the song that I really liked and recorded myself practicing with that song. And then I transcribed a little phrase that I thought would turn into a song based on mm. the song I was practicing. And that's how I started writing out, writing out my tunes. And so... Um, there are several contrafacts on my first record song, but oh, yeah. you know, um the tune the tune um found it is based on a Myron Walden tune called Like a Flower Seeking the Sun. And um yeah, and also one of the tunes uh on the current record, uh, one of the uh, museum pieces is also based on that same tune. I've written two contrafacts based on that. Oh Myron really? Walden oh wow, tune, okay. I really That's cool. like that tune, but they're in different keys, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, it, it varies. I, I think I've gone through periods where I write a lot of contrafacts and then more original stuff. And then I've done a series of records that are um, kind of reimaginings of, of previous works. I did a Anita Baker record, a Janelle Monet, and um, and then I did a Minnie Ripperton one um, over the past 10 years. So so I do a lot of arranging yeah. of songs and stuff and standards and stuff. So yeah, it varies. I try to try to switch it up every once in a while, just try to stay creative that way. Yeah. Do, do you keep like a sketchbook of ideas also or or not really? Um, I used to, you know, I, I would, I used to write everything by hand and then I got into finale. So yeah. I still have a few books of, of things that I need to revisit and finish. But, but yeah, um, nowadays it's like, I'll, I'll write on finale and then command S save it and hopefully go back to it. Um, and, but I do, whenever I practice, I always record myself practicing just to get ideas and, and try to retain them. And I'll go back and listen to them. And, and some of the things that I'll practice may turn into tunes, may turn into melodic material that I can use later. So, so yeah. I do keep an audio record of, of ideas and stuff. Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I used to write by hand and then, I used to write way more when I was writing by hand and because ever since using Sibelius, in my case, I got really lazy, you know, like <laughs> was w way more easier, you know, oh, had yeah, a yeah. sheet of paper, like, oh shit, that sounds nice. Now I have to like, yeah, it, it ruined it for me. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Mark and uh, I saw you with Mark in, in Porgy. How does your story with Mark begin actually? I mean, I know, you, of course, you play in his quartet, and you know he has played with you over the years a lot. But how did you guys hook up yeah. initially? Man, I'm gonna tell you uh, about this was around. I can't remember exactly when it was. It may have been around the time where he injured his finger. Oh, yeah. Um, you remember when that when that happened? It was, you know, I think over ten years ago. Yeah. Um, but I, I used to I used to have a band that played at a club in Boston every weekend called Wally's. Yeah. Played there every weekend for about 20 years. And there was a period where my quintet, we were playing a lot of Mark's music. And oh, really? cool. this one particular night, we were playing Jackie's Place. Oh, yeah, sure. I love it. Yeah. And I had never met him. And somebody walked in that looked just like him. I was like, man, that looks like Mark. As we were playing Jackie's Place, I kid you not. And so we're playing the tune. I'm looking at him. It's a dark club, very small. And so we play the tune. He's got this very stoic Zen look on his face. I couldn't tell if it was him or not. And so <laughs> after we were done with the tune, we were going to go on a break. So we went on a break. And then I went up to him. I was like, are you Mark Turner? And he said, yeah. I was like, wow, it's so nice to meet you. You know, I, you know. so um, that's how I initially met him. And he didn't have his horn with him. So, so I just met him and, you know, just... They said, I hope to work with you one day. You know, up until that point, I had been transcribed. I transcribed all the Dharma days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that all that stuff. Uh, yeah, that stuff. That's amazing. And uh, then I initially got to work with him at a camp in Switzerland called Lang Now. Mm -hmm. They have a camp where they bring in a set faculty and then they work with the musicians. And there's concerts every night. And so the directors of that festival, they brought in the trio fly, but then they wanted 
fly to expand the group so they can have all the instruments be, being taught at the camp. So um, Mark called me for for the brass, for, for trumpet. So I taught trumpet there. And and before we got there, I arranged a bunch of the fly tunes for the whole group. I think it was a septet uh, with Edward Simon, Becca Stevens, um, Lage Lund, um, Larry, Jeff, Mark, and I. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's when we really got, we got to play a bit more then. And, and around that same time, I had started working with Steeplechase. And um, I was about to do my second record, and then I approached him at that camp. I was like, would you want to um, record um, at some point, you know, when I do a Steeple Chase session? He's like, sure. So um, it was actually my third record. I did Songbook first, and then uh, mm. Nothing to Hide, and then I did Here Today. And that was uh, the first time we got to um, record together was in that in that situation. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, that must have been quite cool, actually, for you. Playing Jackie's place, and then you see yeah. Mark Turner. It's like, man, okay. I know. <laughs> That's scary. Yeah. Almost. yeah, we played that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And what about playing? You playing in his band? How did that happen? Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess around that time, um, he he had asked me at some point. You know, would you be interested in playing in my quartet? And I was like, sure. You know, I, I knew a lot of his tunes, yeah. well, most of his songs, you know, and, and Late to Heaven had just come out. And yeah. um, and I think at some point, you know, he and Abishai, Abishai, you know, I think he had moved to India and, you know, he was, you know, moving on. And so um, Mark told me that he had talked to Abishai and Abishai had given him some recommendations and also recommended me too. So between the both of them, they both, um you know recommended me to mark's man so um i guess it was kind of a uh i don't know a, a very lucky um kind of coincidental happenstance for that to, to yeah. happen for them to both uh recommend me but but yeah it's big shoes to fill i'm still trying to fill them because you know um i was shy as a, one of my biggest inspirations you know he was in boston mm -hmm. uh he was just leaving Boston as I got to Boston back in the late nineties. You know, I went to the New England Conservatory and he was at uh, yeah. at Berkeley at the time. And I used to go to sessions and hear him play and I was always astonished. So I've always been a fan of him. Oh so, yeah, I know, but come on. Uh, you know, when, when I listened to the Return from the Stars record and when I saw you live with Mark, man, you did feel those shoes. <laughs> you you made them even oh, bigger. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> No, beautiful, you know. You it's like how you sound together. Like it's really when you trade it, you know, on some tunes you trade kind of solos and yeah, yeah. It's beautiful to hear that, you know. Like uh, uh, how is Mark as a band leader? Um he's a wonderful band leader. I mean, it's yeah. He, he seems so relaxed always on stage for me. He's relaxed and and he's you know, receptive to, to any ideas we might have. Um, you know, he gives us a lot of freedom. Mm. Um, but, you know, he controls the whole vibe with his playing. You know, he's got this Zen way of playing. And, and it's like, when I come into whatever venue we're playing in, and I hear him warming up, I was like, okay, I, I better be on it tonight. I better have it together and and really, really bring it. And, and the thing mm. is, he just he just brings it every time, and and um, you know every time he plays something, it's it's, it's just it, it seems fresh. It's, it's, it comes from some some divine place where mm. um, it's just this this real. I don't know how to. It's like a, a moment in time that won't be repeated at all. Mm, but it's at a certain yeah. level, it's it's like something to 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 really experience. And a lot of times, I'll I'll, I'll find myself looking back at Joe and, and we'll as Mark's improvising on a tune, and we'll say, "Wow, <laughs> he's doing it right here. We can't believe it. What he's what's coming out of that horn? It's not humanly possible, but he's making it possible right now." Mm. And you know, Joe's played with him, you know, yeah. longer than, than Jonathan and I put together, and. <laughs> And so, you know, a lot of it is just led by the music. You know, the tunes that he writes, he, he writes yeah. in a in a way that really makes the band sound bigger than it is. So, so there's a lot of room for 
for small little intricacies within playing melodies with him. You know, the the, the way that he, he is, is his intonation, you know, is so mm-hmm. centered, it, you know, it, it it really allows us to be able to play and listen to each other and, and bend things when we need to and, you know, cut off the cut cutoffs and the articulations and the timing and, you know, all that, that stuff that makes music really, really uh, powerful. Mm-hmm. You know, it just comes so easy to him. So, you know, it's a, it's a, a big, big blessing to play with him because, you know, I've, it's been a, a, a goal of mine. It's been something on my bucket list to, you know, play, play with him. Cause I, I, um, I've been enjoying the ride, but I, I spent a lot of time, um, transcribing his records. When I was in college, uh, I had a few of my classmates who introduced me to his music and Kurt Rosenwinkel's music. And, hmm. and I was like, wow, this is, this is some cool stuff. Um, you know, hopefully I'll get to play with them one day. And, and there was a period in time when I was an orderly at a, a mental institution. I worked there three nights a week oh. uh, and I did overnight shifts on uh, Sunday nights and Monday nights. And in those nights when it was, wasn't busy, I would transcribe, you know, I would just sit down, put on a CD back when CDs were, were the thing. I wore Dharma days out. I wrote out every tune by hand. That's beautiful. And then that's how we started playing Jack, Jackie's place and everything. So, I mean, during that time, I was just in my mind mentally conceiving playing those tunes with those cats and stuff, and so, so yeah, I've been been very lucky to to be able to live out, live, live that out so far. Yeah, so. yeah, it's be- be- beautiful, man. I mean, how was it also like for you to to record the last one for ECM? Your experience working with Manfred, how was that like? Yeah, um, you know, he wasn't at that session. So oh, I, I didn't get okay. to, yeah, I, I didn't get to meet Manfred until that until last November. Oh okay. Um, I think a few days before Vienna, uh we played in oh what's the name? What's that the city where Untefart is? Munich. Oh Munich, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came down to that show, so I, I met him then and took a picture with him. And uh but yeah, when we when we did uh uh Return to the Start um that that record we did it in new york in 2019 i believe mm, yeah and and it was at a nice studio i had never been to that that studio uh, sear sound i believe and there were some mm. representatives from ecm there so i got to meet a few of the people and and um so yeah that was that was fun and we had just played a bit of that music from a tour so it was still fresh and everything uh, but but yeah it was it was great meeting Manfred you know, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, in November. You know, he looked really well, and uh, yeah, and um, you know, that's a great, that's a wonderful label. I yeah, always man. dreamt of being uh, associated with anything on that label. You know, that's that's the first I, I consider a major label that I've worked on, work worked with. So when I mean, besides I mean, besides Steeple Jack, I mean that's, that's sure. a fairly well known label. But but ECM has a ECM is like outreach. yeah yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and mm. you know, after the tour we did back in November, uh, Mark mentioned that they want to do another one soon. So, so oh, we'll fantastic! How, how that how that pans out? You know, we did a live record in in uh, June of last year that's coming out. But actually, we did two. I did two records with Mark. We did one live at the Vanguard back in June and March of last year. We did another one um, in the studio of a, a special project where. He, um, reads from a book and it's more of a avant garde kind of electronic based uh, thing. Oh, really? It's more free. And I don't know, I think the, the live one at the Vanguard is coming out first. Yeah. Oh, fantastic, man. Beautiful. And we did a record with uh, with Nasheed Waits, Matt Brewer, and David Virilis. Um, and Mark and I, we did a, a record back in, in March. Wow. Okay. So, um, so yeah, there's two in the can. Uh, yeah, coming out. And the live one at the Vanguard, we play a lot of the material from Return from the Stars. And, oh, beautiful. Um, and and so yeah, we get to hear the live version of that. So that was a lot of fun to put together. Um, the live one with Mark. So. Oh man, fantastic! Yeah, I wanted to ask you, you know, if uh, the if you have something new coming up with Mark, but yeah, you answered it already. So yeah, beautiful. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah we're doing a tour in in May. And then one in uh, the end of June and July. We'll be in Europe in June and July. Oh, man. This year. Cool. I'll try to catch you if you're near. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, in US in May. Oh, fantastic! Man. Beautiful. Yeah, but uh, you mentioned you know that you transcribed the Dharma days, and uh, but I wanted to go a little bit back. You know, speaking of the trumpet, or maybe it wasn't even the trumpet. You, uh, who got you excited for improvisation? Actually, you know what were the um, players um... or records or. Yeah, the, the first aha moments I, I had were listening to Clifford Brown studying Brown. Um, when I was in high school, I went to I went to a public high school during the day. And then the last three years of high school, I went to a music high school three nights a week. And at that school, it was called the Greensboro Music Academy. I took uh, combo in private lessons. And I think I had a theory class or two. And one night when I was riding back with the piano player in our combo, he popped in a CD and I hear and I was like, okay, <laughs> who is this trumpet player right here? And that, that that line came in on Cherokee and I was like, wow, I need to learn how to play this instrument so I can play like that. And mm -hmm. so that record and then um Hearing Miles Davis, the, the second CD I got was Miles Davis, uh, My Funny Valentine Plus Four mm. More. Yeah. So I heard that. I heard that before I heard Kind of Blue. Um, and then on the non-trumpet side, I, I got uh, uh, Love Supreme. Sure. Because I found out that my hometown, uh, I grew up in a small town in North Carolina called High Point. And that's where John Coltrane grew up um, as a preteen and teenager. And so I wanted to get something by him. And there was a service in the U.S. called the BMG Music Service where they were doing promotionals and sending out mailers, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get people to buy CDs for 10 CDs for eight cents or something like that. And so I ordered those three yeah. CDs, okay. Slade and Brown, you know, Miles Davis, plus, My Funny Valentine plus Four More, um, What Us Love Supreme. And then I also got Midnight Marauders by Tribe Called Quest. I can't remember what else. I love that record. Yeah. Yeah. I love that record. Yeah, so yeah, Clifford Brown was the first one that really got me got me hooked. Yeah. Mm. The uh, did you ever check like? I mean, did you then go investigate like e even you know other players like you know when I listen to you like I heard Kenny Wheeler also and some other sounds you know when I hear you play like the the high notes or maybe I'm, I was mistaken I was listening a lot of to Kenny but like. Did you check, like, for instance, him out as well, or like? Yeah, when I was in college, um, yeah, um, I dated a singer in college who introduced me to New High, and, and oh, that's okay. how I got hooked on uh, Kenny Wheeler. And um, yeah, I, I I did a ton of trans. I was a, a, a avid transcriber. Um, yeah. I got a book that stick with transcriptions. I would just write out stuff, learn how to play it first, write it out, figure out what was what. Um, so yeah, Clifford was the first one, and I started checking out a lot of Kitty Durham, um, yeah. uh, Early Miles, transcribed a lot of uh, Nicholas Payton. Transcribed actually the first transcription I, I actually did was of Nicholas Payton on uh, uh, Gumbo Niveau on mm. uh, Whooping Blues when I was in high school. I you know I got out. That was another CD I got on that on that uh, little BMG service was uh, um, <laughs> Gumbo Niveau. By Nicholas Payton. So yeah, I transcribed Whooping Blues, uh, well, book, a ton of Book a Little, and Freddie Hubbard. You know, uh, and, and from there I just started to check out players yeah. who were their contemporaries, like Lee Morgan and Woody Shaw, and you know Thad Jones and you know Kenny Wheeler, uh, all the way up. You know Tom Harrell. You know mm -hmm. all all the greats. And, you know I, I kind of consider myself a, a historian because I like to um, check out people's playing, find out what makes them them, you know, learn from them and then try to find that little corner where there's mm -hmm. a, some style that hasn't really been touched on or some kind of approach to the instrument that hadn't been touched on. But, you know, it's, it's so difficult to do nowadays because, you know, um, the, the the world of creativity is so wide and, mm -hmm. you know, you can find what you're looking for in, the, in any group of player, I think. So it's just a matter of just trying to find out what feels true to you when you play. So, I mean, that's how I deal with 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 improvisation whenever i'm working with people um but yeah i just did a ton of transcribing and um learning tunes yeah um i would i would go to jam sessions when i was in college and 
find the tunes that people were playing. If I didn't know them, I'd go to a record store, spend all my work study money, get that record, learn the tune on that record, and learn all the tunes on that record. And then I read the liner notes so I could, you know, find out about these players' lives. And it made me more um, invested in, you know, what they were playing and who they were. And it made me want to play um, with that okay. much more in, in intensity. So, so, yeah, I think, yeah, that, that was an important uh, period for me is, you know, checking out records and reading the liner notes and sitting down and actively listening and, and learning, learning the music that way. I've, I've always kind of been that way. Um, especially, but especially in my formative years, when I was mm. able to learn how to play the instrument the right way and learn the uh, ins and outs of how music works. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I was the same. You know, I, I, I think I transcribed from from the. I have also like transcription. This, you know, I was obsessed. Let's say with Chris Potter. Then I transcribed from the first five records he did or six, like every Chris Potter song. Just like okay, then Joe Lovano, then like you know horn players and. Uh, I think that's a nice way to learn, just to listen and transcribe and the language. And mm -hmm. but uh, when you when you were at New England Conservatory, uh, you know who who were the first connections you started to make, and uh, how was it for you? Like you know, entering the scene slowly. Who were the first people you actually got gigs with? Yeah, you know the the first trumpet players that I really um started to really work with right when I got to Boston in 1997 in the fall I was walking up the street from New England Conservatory you walk about half a mile up Mass Ave there was a record store up there called uh there was Tower Records mm. and so I went up there got some record and I was walking back to school and I and to get there you got to walk past Berkeley because it's right Berkeley's right on Mass Ave so I was walking down back down the street and this guy pulls me to the side of the street um He's like, hey, man, you play trumpet? I was like, yeah. And he's like, oh, you go to Berkeley? I was right in front of Berkeley. I was like, no, I go to uh, New England Conservatory. He's like, oh, you go to New England Conservatory? <laughs> and he's like, come with me. I was like, okay, where are we going? He's like, we're going to go to this place called Wally's. And so Wally's was straight down Mass Ave, past the conservatory, about two blocks down the street. And so there was a jam session. This was on a Sunday. And so he takes me to this jam session, and um, he's like, okay, I want you to play for me. And so he sits down. And then I call a tune. I think it was out of nowhere. Mm. I barely knew the tune, but I played on it. It's like, and after I was done, he says, oh, man, you sound good. Um, but you need to work on this. You need to work on that. Come over to my house next week, and we'll I'll give you a lesson. I was like, "This who is this guy? He, yeah. And it turned out it was Jeremy Pelt. Oh, wow. That's so cool. So, wow. And he wasn't that much more older than me. Yeah, yeah exactly. He just finished in Berkeley, and I just got to – on uh, there to NEC and so I went over to his house in Mission Hill I uh, had a lesson with him and turn find out um he tells me yeah my band's playing at Wally's on on Friday I can't remember if it was Friday or Saturday but it was one of those nights so I went checked them out and then I went the next night and I heard another trumpet player named Darren Barrett and it turns out they were roommates and so um I met him and then I went over to their house got a lesson from him Mm. You know, so I go one week, have a lesson with him, and then go the next week, have a lesson with Jeremy Pelt. Uh, I had a couple of lessons with, with both of them, but um, the main lessons were going to hear them play at the club. And so outside of school, that happened outside of school. But when I got to school, um, you know, my teacher uh, that that gave me the most was John McNeil. Mm. Um, yeah. he, he probably taught me. I mean, he, he, you know, I had to retrain myself how to play the trumpet. I you know, I redid my embouchure um, from from the bottom up my freshman year, and I didn't have any issues after that. Um, I put all my trust in him. He he taught me how to play changes. He taught me how to, you know, he taught me how to practice. You know, so I so important, I, yeah. I give every all the credit to him because he he taught me how to troubleshoot things, how to really assess my own playing, and uh, a lot of the things that he gave me. I'm working with my students now um, to do the same. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, between him, those three trumpet players, they they did the the most uh, work with me to to get me to where I am now. Mm -hmm. um, like the first uh, people I started working with, I mean, I, I played regularly with a saxophone player named Grant Langford. Um, mm -hmm. He he, probably, I think he gave me my first club dates in Boston, and we played at a place called there were. Uh, a series of restaurants they all were called the good life 
and there was one downtown we played there and then there was another place in uh austin called the wonder bar so i played there quite a bit on thursdays with grant langford and kendra scott was in the band for a minute and vicente archer was Ooh. on bass and i think warren wolf played piano at times or dan kaufman and so there was some great young players back then um and that was on top of going to Wally's on the weekends. Yeah. Um, but then when I, when I got out of school, my main gig um, where I started touring a bit was with Greg Osby. And that was in the early 2000s. I toured a lot with him in Europe mm. in like 2003 and four. That was the first time you went to Europe? Jazz-wise? Um, and... The first tour I did. Yeah. yeah the, the first tour I did in Europe, yeah. The first time I went to Europe was a couple of years before that. I played with a... Uh, uh, a French drummer named Julian Ogier mm. and uh, Leo Genovese was on okay. piano for that and Damien Cabot a great bass player mm -hmm. yeah from know. Portugal yeah. Uh, David Patel was a yeah in a, a guitarist uh, named David Patel mm. um, so that was the first time I went I did like three concerts in, in France with them that was the first time I ever went overseas that was the reason I really got my passport yeah <laughs> how was it like working with greg i mean you know it's highly complex music and unique sounds you know he has created and yes very very much complex that's the word um but yeah i, I learned a ton from him uh you know i, I got in his band because i emailed him you know when i was um finishing <laughs> school i put together this is before social media was a thing um it, it my space was around it was just mm -hmm. starting so it was kind of a thing but um, I put together a list of, I don't know how hundreds of musicians that I want to play with. And I put together a list of record labels, a list of managers. And and so I emailed um, all of them a mass email. It's like, okay, I'm a trumpet player. I just um, graduated. You know, I really love your music. It was real general, you know. And um, there was a website called SoundClick where you could post your music like mp3 clips and have like a profile mm. and people could download the stuff so so i sent them a link to that and then i must have emailed probably a couple of hundred musicians and i got responses back from like i don't know less than 10 of those people and of those 10 responses one or two of them said they were interested in greg osby was one of them he had just put oh. out st louis shoes and that mm. uh, record public which had Nicholas Payton on him and he was going to do a tour and he was looking for a trumpet player. So he was like, Hey man, um, you sound good. You know, do you have your passport? And, um, and I posted like a bootleg of me playing autumn leaves with Tim Warfield at Wally's, mm -hmm. you know, he, had, um, Tim had come down to sit in with us after his gig with Nicholas Payton. So he played with us and, you know, I recorded every gig that I ever did at that club. And so I just put a, put together a little clip of that, maybe another clip of another song, but Greg heard that online. He was like, hey man, looking for a trumpet player? So I was like, sure. And I had those records, so I knew those tunes, like St. Louis Shoes and, and um, but then he had some other tunes that he wanted to send. Um, so he sent me these charts and one was of a tune called Equilatogram. That's a tough tune. And I didn't have a recording of that tune because the only record I could find um, that I eventually found was a Japanese import. Hmm. And so I didn't get to hear the tune before I practiced it. And so I practiced the chart that he sent me, but it was in a, it was in the wrong key. It was in um, either B flat or concert. I can't remember, but I learned all the other tunes in either B flat or concert. And so we get to Salamanca. My first gig with him was a tryout. It was in Salamanca, Spain. We did one gig and we're backstage looking at the melodies and I'm playing with him and I'm a whole step off. I was like, oh, oh man, shit. what's going on? I, I need to learn. I better transpose this stuff right quick and so i got through the gig and and he's like okay you're hired man and so then i started to tour with him quite a bit and uh you know with him uh i learned how to survive on the road mm. you know he taught me little tricks you know to take a, a apple and orange from the green room you know just to you know yeah. have some sustenance you know going from city to city, might not have time to sit down and eat, you know, take some peanuts, you know, whatever. Um, 
you know, how to wash it a lot, you know, wash your clothes in the sink in the hotel room, you know, all the good yeah, yeah. stuff, you know, take, you know, you can hang it to dry. If you got two nights off in one city, that's where you do laundry, right? And you get there, you know, I'll just, you know, iron your clothes and, you know, so that stuff outside of music, but on the bandstand, you know, we did a lot of collective improvisation mm. in his band when I was with him. And, you know, he'd always pull me to the side and give me little pointers on what he heard in my playing. So it was a lot of uh, constructive guidance from him you know he say, okay yeah when we're playing together if i'm playing high don't play high with me play low you know if i'm playing a lot of notes you know sustain some notes you know mm. he told me one one thing he told me is like jason man when you're when you're improvising when you finish the solo it sounds like you're finishing with a comma it's like i need to hear you in with like an exclamation point sure, or yeah. period it's like i get the feeling like you're not really tying everything together i was like okay he just had me thinking about those kind of things um, in a real, almost uh, not a ethereal way, but a real concrete way, because there is a way to to play your, play my instrument and yeah. put that, that feeling across. And so I had to really learn how to do that. Hmm. And he was the first person to um, really give me a chance and, and then give me, me not, not even just me, you know, everybody in the band, he was always giving us stuff. You know, we were all young in the band. It was me, uh, Matt Brewer, and Tommy, Tommy probably, Crane. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tommy Crane and uh, Megumi Yonazawa was on piano on most of the gigs I did with them. But yeah, so so he took us in. He was like the Art Blakey. Yeah, yeah. Of, uh, That's important. Of, of our generation, yeah. Yeah. W was this first your tour experience with Greg, like how you expected it? You know, when, he, when you're young, I remember my first you have this romantic idea of touring and then you realize actually it's not so easy. I mean, what was your first experience of like this longer tour? Yeah. The first, the first long tour after the Salamanca gig we did, it was pretty extensive tour of just Spain and Portugal. Oh, wow. Okay. That's easy. So it was, Dear. It was okay. nice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we did like, a dozen concerts all in Spain. This one went La Bikina. I don't know if there's still a thing, that company. Um, I think... Actually, I saw uh, I saw one of the workers when I was in Barcelona last, uh, in, back in November. I, I I don't know if he was still working for them. I don't know if they're still doing uh, tour, tour management and stuff, yeah. but it, they had put together a tour. So it was uh, quite... Quite easy. I mean, it, the, the travel and getting from place to place wasn't... That's easier. Wasn't yeah. stressful. Yeah, so, um, yeah, whenever I've toured with Greg, it's always been in Europe. You know, I've never been to Japan. I've never been to South America. Um, and so it's mostly Europe, and which is, you know, pretty easy to get yeah. around. You know, the, the trains are very efficient and, you know, the flights aren't aren't far usually. And so, so yeah, it's, it's I've been, been lucky in that way to, you know, tour it. To, to have the first experience touring with him be as smooth as it was, um, yeah. and yeah, the music was was fine, and yeah, I mean, yeah. the hang was great. Yeah, yeah. You you got a yeah. There are so many factors when you, especially as a band leader, start organizing your own tours. That yeah, you have to consider then. I mean, but if you you know you tour with players like Greg, you you see you learn and observe what not to do or as as a band leader and yeah, but, mm -hmm. yeah i wanted to ask you how, how did you decide to do songbook and uh when did you realize that after you know all the playing with and studying that okay i'm gonna do a record as a band leader how, how did that one happen oh yeah um when it, that record came out on a label called iva Musica, which is based in Spain. And the head of that label at the time, uh, his name is uh, Pablo, oh, what is his last name? I can't remember his last name off, offhand, it's been so long, but but yeah, he approached me initially to to do a record. He came down to Wally's once and heard, heard me play. And mm, okay. um, so so he, he asked me to do a record and I was like, sure. And so at that, at that time I was planning on um, recording the band that I had at Wally's. And, you know, I had, had a bunch of tunes ready and and um, in that band, I had trumpet, guitar and the rhythm section, um, piano, bass, drums. And so um, a few days before the recording, the guitar player, he got sick. And so we had to, I, 
either had to cancel the recording or find someone else. So I got uh, That's a Warren the, game, I guess. Yeah, Warren. So Warren did did the initial um, recording in a studio in Boston, and we booked two days there, and it was a horrible experience. And so oh, we canned that whole session. Oh man, we canned it, and, and um, Pablo he said, you know, um, let's let's wait a bit until the right situation. So I think uh, maybe three four months later, um, you know, I at, at that yeah in in those three months I met Robbie Coltrane. I played um, in New York at the Sim School with him, and um, I told him I was doing my first record. And I asked him, you know, if he'd want to mm -hmm. um, okay. play, and so that's how I got him on board. And um, and so at, for some reason, Pablo was able to increase the budget from the first session to the next session. And so I was, we were able to do it in New York over a couple of days. And um, and I was able to bring in, you know, Osby, Ravi and Leo and yeah. Tommy and Matt. And, you know, it was, I had written a, a handful of tunes, uh, enough for at least two records by that time. So we recorded a lot of material and um Yeah, I love the music that on Priest Lake that it starts. It's like you know, checkmate and like uh, some some other tunes. I, I I love the writing on that one. Oh thanks. The, yeah. Beautiful music. Yeah, so um so yeah, we put it together and that was a real um I don't think I've done a record like a studio record like that since. Where you get two days because all the steeple chase records I've done, you know, it's it's like a four or five hour session. Yeah, it's like crisscross kind of, yeah, and then yeah. edit edit later. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, that kind of got spoiled on my first experience there because we did it at Systems Two, and then I came back like a yeah. few weeks later and did the mixing and mastering. So, um, so yeah, the just that record was I don't know uh, a special snapshot of what what's going on there with that label and you know then they did Esperanza's record and um the photographer was uh Lourdes Delgado great photographer I think she's living in Spain now hmm. um so yeah they put together a nice package for that I'm really thankful for for them to uh, come on board and, and have faith in me and you know hmm. put out my first because everybody remembers your first record you know they'll they'll get your 10th 15th record but then you know the next one they get of you is the first one true you know, yeah. it's usually happened that way, especially with me. I, I've when I was on tour just now, you know, people are coming up to me. They they have like live at Summit Village, or they have the the um, Isabella Stewart one that I did a couple of years ago, and then they have songbook. I was like, yeah, it's like thirteen, fourteen in between. That, yeah. but, you know, yeah, but who? But but I'm, I'm appreciative for for anybody who can search search out any of my music. So. Yeah, so yeah, that was a that was a fun uh, experience, you know, getting to have Greg Osby play some of my music. Oh man, yeah, you know, I've been so... playing a lot of his music, and you know, he brought some cool stuff to it. Robbie did too, you know, Warren, Warren did, you know. Um, so yeah, I was grateful for for all of them. Yeah, it's a k k killing band, man. If you just, it's it's awesome, and the music, like you said, you know, and I, I, yeah, ever since you've been so prolific, I think you put out a record. Almost every year, almost. Yeah, just or about, you, yeah. Just about mm -hmm. you did, yeah. It's it, yeah. With, with original music and, you know, that's 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 quite amazing, mm -hmm. actually. But uh, in between, I, I wanted to ask you about, you, you know, I have one record of yours with Billy Hart. And uh, how did you get involved oh, yeah. with, with Billy, actually? I mean, I know... Oh, I think, Billy. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, the guru. Well, you know, know Billy, um, he teaches at... Yeah, he really is. You know, he teaches at New England Conservatory. And um, there was a time when I was teaching in a preparatory school there. And um, that, that program happens on the weekends. And so I was there one Saturday and one student didn't show up. And so I was in my practice room practicing. And, uh, and Billy was there. He was, I think he was there doing makeups or something. So he knocks on the door and he, come, he comes in and he says, hey, young man. You sound like you're getting to the truth, man. Keep keep working on it, man. I was like, wow, Mr. Hart, that means a lot. Thanks so much. And I just kept practicing. And so then uh, about a year after that, I was doing a camp in Portugal in Guimarães. Mm -hmm. And um, that camp, they had 
you know, every night they would have, it's like a festival. They have music concerts every night and then they have jam sessions and then they have clinics in the daytime and stuff. And one night the cookers came mm -hmm. and um, they did a concert and then there was a jam session that we hosted. The faculty members hosted this jam session. So he came down to that. And so we played a little bit and he was, and then he said, Hey man, you, you sound good. Uh, I'm doing this record in, in uh, New Jersey. Um, you know, in, in a couple of months, can you make the, the session, man? I was like, sure. <laughs> so he put together, you know, a band, Dan Teffer, Chris. Yeah, it's Dan, amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those cats. And, and, um, that was how I got introduced to Neil's at Steeplechase. You know, that was before, um, I actually started recording with Steeplechase because at that session for Billy, um, he asked us all to bring in an arrangement. So I brought in an arrangement of, uh, Eric Dolphy tune. And uh, some other people bought some other stuff. And after we were done recording all of that stuff, um, Neil's added up the minutes of music. He's like, oh, we need one more song to make it a CD length. Mm. It's like, does anyone have anything? And and uh, nobody had anything. But I was like, okay, I just wrote a tune. I have it in my case. So let me go get it. So we made copies of this ballad. Oh, that's, and, yeah, the, um, the lovely. We recorded that yeah. tune. Yeah. That's just love. That's all. Yeah. And, yeah. and so... Um, after that, Neil said, oh, so young man, so you compose. Would you want to do something with Sipo Chase at some point? I was like, sure. <laughs> and that's how I got my deal with uh, with Neil's. Oh, okay. Stu Billy, you know. Mm. That's beautiful, yeah. Did, uh, did you ever play gigs? It's a lesson. Gigs with him um, also? Or? I don't know if I've ever done a gig with Billy. No, I've hmm. only done that record. There, oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and that? yeah, I guess so. The the lesson for me was that always practice, practice your best. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you never know who's listening, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, was sound it? bad, but not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've read on your website you, you also played with Roy. Speaking of drummers, Haynes. Yeah, uh, I played with Roy. Hog I mean, Roy uh, Haynes once. Yeah. Um, when was that? That was actually when I was in school in uh at New England Conservatory. Oh. Um, Roy Haynes' brother um is a pastor up in Boston. I don't know if he's still still with us, uh, but yeah, at the time he he's a pastor um at a at a church in Boston and every January Roy would come up and, mm -hmm. and do a service and play. And um this one particular uh year Dave Bryant, this great piano player who lives in Japan now, he he was classmates with Marcus Gilmore. Mm. And so um, Marcus Gilmore came up and Graham Haynes came up uh, to, to Boston to do this service. And they and Roy wanted a band. And so Marcus called Dave Bryant and asked Dave Bryant, yeah, can you get a horn player and a bass player, you know, and you can play piano and, and Roy wants to play. And Mm. So Dave called me to like, can you come to this church and, and play with Roy? I was like, of course. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I got to play. Uh, I can't remember what tunes we played, but, but yeah, I got to play with him and took a picture with him and he told me um, some stories. And, beautiful. Yeah. he's Yeah. I mean, I was just a one-time thing, you know. I, so uh, that was like my, the first like really, really prolific person that I played with outside of school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the, talking about, yeah. High level, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's incredible. Man. Uh, Jason, I always I, I wanted to ask you. You know, you you said you're going to be in uh, touring in May and July, June, also with Mark. Mm -hmm. What about you as a band leader? Like, uh, what's this upcoming year or upcoming weeks or months? What's happening for you or gig wise or? Um, I'm still writing for some some projects. Uh... Back in 2019, I got a a, a grant from the Chamber of Music of America oh, Foundation okay. to do a uh, a project that's a continuation of the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum project. So I got to complete that. I'm actually past my due date, so I hope I can still complete it. But hopefully, I want to I'm going to finish that up and um, premiere the music. And that project has um, Mark Turner, Joel Ross, uh, Kendrick Scott, and um, Edward Perez on it. It's the same band as yeah. that record. Um, so yeah, I need to premiere that in the U in the continental U S uh, this year. And, um, you know, at the moment, um, uh, we, my family and I, we just moved to a new place, uh, here in New Hampshire. So I live about 80 miles North of Boston. Oh, really? So, okay. Know, a ton, Beautiful. Ton of work on the house and stuff, you know, it's Sunday. we're constructing things, you know, building 
things in the house. It's getting the house in order. So, but New Hampshire, oh, man, beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful up here, man. Absolutely. Yeah, we got two and a half acres of land and yeah, nice scenery and quiet and you know, so so yeah, we up here and so at the moment I got more energy focused focused on, on building that up. So Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I got a few few little things here and there. I'm playing a concert next week in Boston with a great young um tenor player named Gregory Groover, playing some of his music. Um but yeah, as a leader, just that Chamber Music America thing. And then I have to do, a, I also have to do another live record uh, with Giant Step Arts. Um, so I've already written the music for that. I just got to find a date and find a place. Uh, it'd probably be um, on the East Coast. Yeah. It's going to be recorded by Jimmy and, and Dina Katz. And um, that project initially was scheduled to be um, Mark Turner, Nasheed Waits, and Ben Williams. Mm. And uh, Joel. Mm. We'll, we'll see. Um, okay. See who who's available. I know a lot of people moved. Sure. Uh, over the past few years, so. It's so beautiful. Yeah, be a, it's a, uh, a set of quintet music. So yeah, those two two of the main projects. So. Oh man, hoping that's to complete fantastic. by the end of this calendar year. So. Fantastic. That's beautiful, man. Uh, yeah, I, I'll leave you be then to restore the house. <laughs> oh. oh man. <laughs> no, yeah. but thanks, man. Thanks, Jason, for sharing some of these Pleasure. stories. Yeah. I really appreciate it and. If you're in Europe, close to me, I'll Absolutely. definitely catch you. So and pull you by the sleeve and yeah. drink a beer together or something. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll...